everyone. Welcome to The Safe House, brought to you by The Safe House Initiative. I'm Jeff Edwards, co-chair of The Safe House Initiative and your host for today's podcast. Not many in the Safe House Initiative community realize that Alan, Jen, and I were inspired to create the Safe House Initiative from the cyber insurance industry. The industry expressed on several meetings that we're having, uh, business meetings of our software company, and they expressed the, a need, uh, a dire need actually, especially for small, mid-sized businesses to have education for cyber security and also operational resilience that is easy to understand, easy to access, and not have to sift through all of these vendor presentations and solutions. So today, uh, we're very fortunate to have a gentleman who knows uh, not only the insurance industry, uh, especially cyber insurance industry, and has grown up with it, but he also really understands small, mid-sized businesses. Eric Cernak is the president of cyber at the Hanover Insurance Group, and so I'm extremely pleased to welcome you, Eric. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate the time and the opportunity. I'm really looking forward to the uh, the chance here to talk a little bit about cyber risk and uh, insurance in particular and how that applies to small businesses. Excellent. You know, we've got a big worldwide community and uh, you may not know every one of them, but uh, why don't you introduce yourself to them, kind of share with them, you know, kind of your background, how you kind of grew up, and uh, then we can talk maybe about how the insurance industry is uh, changing. Sure. No, I think that's a great way to start this. Um, so, you know, as you said, my name is Eric Cernak and I, I do lead uh, Hanover Cyber Insurance business here. And I've I've been working in this space for over 20 years now. Uh, and it's been a fascinating space to, to see and to kind of grow up in. Um, as I've seen both the exposures facing small businesses, as well as the solutions available to those small businesses evolve greatly uh, over those 20 years. And it's also been a very interesting journey to hear a lot of the misconceptions, as I would mm. put them, you know, during that 20 year period, especially as it pertains to small businesses. And I think I think that's really at the heart of, of everything that we're, we're trying to do um, in terms of, you know, just making sure people understand the world that we live in today when it comes to cyber risk. Mm. And uh, it's, it's a challenging, challenging place because it uh, evolves so quickly. So what are those misconceptions, Eric? They range widely, but a lot of what I hear is, you know, we're not we're not large enough to garner the attention of those threat mm-hmm. actors. You know, the bad yeah. guys won't pay any attention to me. So so how am I at risk? Or they may say, yeah, that happens. But I, I operate in a, you know, quote unquote, safe class of business. Right. I'm not I'm not healthcare care or, or some other class of business that that garners right. the headline action these days or. For many, many years, it was, I don't collect any personally identifying information. And so there's nothing, you know, I have nothing at risk. Um, We'll hear, hey, I can trust my employees. They're not going to do anything that would uh, jeopardize the the business. Another one I hear all the time is we're not dependent on computers. It's, you know, it's kind of funny that uh, (laughs) I I think that part of the struggle is technology has become so ubiquitous in our daily and professional lives that it's reliance, our reliance upon it is so often overlooked and taken for granted that we don't actually put the appropriate emphasis on on the exposure that it that it can generate and kind of the, the flip side to that is you know if i'm not dependent on computers maybe i am but but i put everything in the cloud so i have nothing to worry about those are the top ones that you know we, we tend to hear and there is probably you know some backing to some of those as as again the you know the, the coverage and uh the exposure has evolved over 20 years from you know what i would say was predominantly a privacy, you know, media type driven exposure to now more of a business interruption supply chain type of exposure. So there is some basis for some of these misconceptions, I think. So the business interruption portion, uh, how how does that evolve? Because you think back to the United Healthcare change management, I think that was earlier this year, the bigger impact was the business interruption that wasn't the, the direct ransomware, but it was the follow on impact. Is that a bigger problem? You know, it very well can be for, for several classes of business. And, you know, I think, I think it helps to take a step back and kind of look at how the exposure and the, and the response to that exposure has kind of evolved over the the 20 something odd years. Um, if you think about it, you know, cyber insurance is, is quite fascinating because it's perhaps one of the only coverages that has had to evolve at the speed of mm-hmm. technology. 
Yeah. And you can kind of trace it all the way back to media liability. And, and if you remember, you, you know, Y2K insurance policies, uh, everybody yeah. was afraid when the when the clock ticked over, computers were going to stop working. And so that was the, the genesis of some of these policies. Yeah. And then I think, you know, kind of evolving through that, it, it quickly focused on breaches of personally identifying information. If that information gets out, the people's information could be, you know, they could suffer identity theft. And so mm -hmm. there was a bunch of state notification laws that came in. So that then introduced some additional regulatory exposure to, to businesses and, and again, future and, and, and again, potential third party actions as well. Mm -hmm. and, and that really was where the coverage and the exposure was for, for a number of years. But interestingly, you know, ransomware kind of started to blossom um, in probably about 2016, 2018. Yeah. Okay. You know, and, and that's where we start to see it kind of tip a little bit, I think, and get into mm. where you're talking about some of the business interruption exposure. And, you know, everybody thinks of, of ransomware. It's, it's, you know, it's in the news all the time now. It's been around for a lot longer than I think people might realize. There's, you know, recorded instances of it going all the way back to 1989. But between then and, say, the mid-20-teens, the threat actor had to interact with you, right, to uh, yes. to get paid for that ransomware. But along came virtual currency, cryptocurrency, which uh, you know, quasi-anonymized it. Yeah. And then they really started to to enable that exposure. And, and then what the threat actors kind of came away with is we can exert even more influence if we look at those types of businesses that would have a business interruption event associated with it. So if they can't access their systems and they can't make widgets, let's say, then they're they're going to be more inclined to pay. And so that's where the shift really came, started to come into business interruption. And, and then the threat actors got really clever and said, we can utilize not only the uh, business interruption element of it, but you know, if we also take some person identifying information, we can also hearken back to the, the days of breaches of personal information. And so they kind of a, a double, a double whammy there. So that that's really mm -hmm. when you look at the evolution of it and kind of getting back to the root of your question, you know, it started as a privacy exposure. It's morphed very quickly into a business interruption exposure and it's continuing to morph. So you know, you had the teens, if you will, the, the 20 teens, the crypto came along and kind of made it a lot easier and less and harder to track down the bad actors uh, from a payment standpoint. But then along comes COVID and everybody mm -hmm. goes home and yep. the, frail, the frailties of our infrastructure start to show through and the threat actors take advantage of that. So would that be like an accelerant to this problem? Yeah, I think I think that's a, a fair way of looking at it. I think, you know, virtual currency was the enabler, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of took it to the next level. And then when you throw on top of that a pandemic that sends everybody home, everybody is working remotely. What does that do? That that increases uh, the attack surface that you have right. to defend, right, as yeah. a yeah. as a business owner or a business. And so that that really then accelerates the the exposure because now it's potentially a lot larger uh, area from which threat actors can can operate on. As you would define today, cyber insurance. What are the the critical uh, aspects of it? And uh, you know, when you're talking to these folks to say, oh, you know, I I really don't depend upon computers or my business isn't big enough. You say, wait a minute. Here are the things that. A policy should and can offer you. What are those? What are those elements? Can you kind of walk us through that? Sure, and I, I like to put them into a couple main buckets because the the kind of fascinating thing about cyber insurance is again it's evolving so quickly. The exposures evolve. You'll you'll find different coverages and different names for things, but I like to just kind of compartmentalize and put it into a couple of big buckets. And and the yeah. first would be your your third party privacy and security liability. And, and oftentimes mm -hmm. that'll include a little bit of media liability coverage as well. So, so that's really your third party liability component. And, and that has its roots in some of the stuff we just talked about, right? With data mm -hmm. breaches and PII. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of shift and, and I would break the, what we call first party, which is, you know, your kind of more your direct uh, exposure, your direct costs of responding to an incident into maybe one of three buckets. 
I think the first is your breach response costs, and that, that can cover things like uh, forensic IT investigations, mm -hmm. notifications to affected individuals whose information has been breached, as well as services. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're going to give uh, identity restoration services or credit monitoring or something like that. That's your first bucket of, of kind mm -hmm. of those first party. Your second bucket of those first party would be kind of what we were just talking about, your loss of income, business mm -hmm. interruption, extra expense. So again, that you'll, you'll see that uh, in terms of business interruption, contingent business interruption, which starts to get into your supply chain exposure. So and maybe it's an interrupting event at one of your suppliers. That and So that's yeah. the second main bucket. And then I'd say that the third bucket, and this is kind of where we're, you know, I think evolving the, the exposure is continuing to evolve into is in the fraud element and so you could have mm -hmm. funds transfer fraud or computer fraud which oftentimes can include something called invoice manipulation mm -hmm. most people have heard of maybe social engineering or they may call it false pretense coverage or computer resources fraud coverage or crypto jacking telejacking things of that nature where some somebody's using your resources for their gain Th those are the main buckets that I think you'll you'll find in a typical cyber policy. Okay. Um, so you know that's just the coverage element of it. Yeah. So what about the fraud? Is is AI becoming a really big problem in that particular segment? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that certainly could again function much like an accelerator. You know, if you haven't heard, you may see more and more um, discussion about you know quote unquote deep fakes and you know, the ability to spoof somebody uh, more effectively, which, you know, would allow people to, I'll say, authenticate transfers more readily. Um, so again, just enabling an exposure that's already there and has already been fairly prevalent. I, I do think as AI takes, you know, generative AI in particular takes more hold, uh, it certainly could uh, increase the exposure there on social engineering. I think it could also tie into the media liability coverage as well in terms of um, infringement. So I think there's a couple of different elements where where the Gen AI could could function as an accelerator to things that are already covered typically on a cyber policy. As the industry uh, adapting and uh, adopting new methods, what are some of the new things that are being uh, considered or introduced into the marketplace. Uh, more integration with technologies uh, and, and as part of the offerings or what's happening? So coverage is obviously an important aspect of a, of a holistic solution, but you know, a, a lot of the time you'll also find a suite of proactive services that can be made available to you mm -hmm. as a as a policy holder. And, and these can include free consulting services. Um, you know, maybe you got a question about how to configure your email securely or start thinking mm -hmm. about, you know, some other uh, activities like uh, network segmentation or dark web monitoring okay. um, and, and uh, access to pre-vetted tools as well. Uh, endpoint detection and response is a big category now and a, a lot of emphasis being placed on that. And so there could be discounts to, to those types of tools. The other thing, you know, and that's on the proactive side, the other element to always look at and consider is, you know, if you do unfortunately suffer an incident of some sort, you know, it's usually on a Friday evening uh, after mm -hmm. business hours and panic, mm -hmm. you know, as you are, you don't know where to turn. So uh, a big element of it is is having access to, you know, claims adjusters that specialize in this uh, exposure that are available 24 seven to help the insured respond. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll kind of step in and be that quarterback so they can help triage the the customer, make mm. sure that that insured then gets to the appropriate reactive service providers. You might need an attorney, you might need a forensic specialist, yeah. maybe you need a public relations specialist. And all these people are already you know generally pre-vetted. You don't have to figure out who to call. That part is already part and parcel to the solution being provided to you. And so I think that is also invaluable. You know, if someone has got their their business under attack, you know, knowing where to turn. So I have a small business. What would you recommend as a bare minimum? If I don't have, uh, you know, a cyber policy today, what would you recommend? And maybe that's a very, you know, a little too detailed, but I think you know, people want to understand where they can start and just kind of get a, at least some basic 
elements. Yeah, and, and I think you, you said the key word there. It's it's the start, right? A, a lot of times yeah. this can be overwhelming for people. Um, and so just having a place to start and, and, and starting small and start tackling the things that, you know, might have the most impact, you know, per dollar spent. I like to look at, you know, maybe four or five things in particular that I think can offer good starting steps in terms of bolstering your overall cyber hygiene. And, and one is very, very easy. It's referred to as an incident response plan. And, and that just simply uh, details who's going to need to be contacted and the steps that need to be taken mm. in order to effectively respond to that incident. You know, time is going to be of the essence when you experience an incident. And this can can save a significant amount of time and ensure that you're clearly attacking the problem in front of you. And as a subset of that, one of the things that's also very helpful is basic as it is, uh, is an asset inventory. It's a good idea so that you have an inventory of your digital and computing assets, because then you know what you need to focus on. Where is your important data? What's your important assets? What do I need to focus? Where, you know, what do I need to protect? So that would be the first thing I would, I would look at. It's pretty efficient to do, not a lot of heavy lifting. You know, the second thing, most people have heard of it by now, multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication, mm-hmm. MFA, it goes by a lot of different names, but but basically gravitating away from a traditional uh, username and password, which yeah. those credentials can be stolen very easily or fished away from you. So having that two-factor in there and, and generally, you know, you got to start someplace, right? You could start with email, you could start with remote access. Uh, those accounts that have maybe administrator access, you know, those are the three areas that I think I would start with that should help you know, building upon that. I might look to uh, backups, you know, make sure you're backing up mm. your critical data and systems. Yeah. Obviously backups don't help you prevent incidents from happening, yep. but if you make regular, regular and immutable backups, you know, basically those that can't be changed it can greatly reduce the time needed to recover from a ransomware event. And uh, if if you've got those quality backups, um, and and I would say the flip side to that is not only have the backups, but know actually how to restore. You know, a lot of times people say, I've got backups, and then they don't test the restoration process. And that can be very, a very challenging thing to do as well. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe the the last item kind of is, is twofold. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, endpoint detection and response, Mm -hmm. um, basically a tool that can get deployed. And when it's configured correctly, it'll just look for anomalous behavior and it can isolate and quarantine that. So again, Mm -hmm. it's possible that an incident is occurring, but it prohibits that incident from growing out of control, right? It it can kind of quarantine it and hopefully um, limit that, that damage associated with it. Laid on top of that would be MDR or managed detection and response. And that's essentially mm-hmm. just having a professional organization that's available mm-hmm. to help configure and monitor that EDR solution. Because again, you might not have time as a, as a smaller business to know what happens, you know, or know how to respond to that stuff. So having somebody professionally manage it for you uh, can go a long way. But again, you know, none of these controls are going to be you know, it's not a comprehensive list, right? It, it's obviously a solid start to increasing your cyber hygiene. The other thing I'd throw in there is if you know, if a small business is going through the cyber insurance process, you know, oftentimes yes. you're going to be asked to do an application. And a lot of times people, you know, like, oh, I got to fill out an application. But really think of that application as a set of best practices. And it's almost like a self-assessment for mm-hmm. your security posture. So it can kind of point you to things to look at. So like say a a basic policy, what is there a rule of thumb that say, let's say I have a $50 million type of a company and I I have a few hundred uh, employees. Is there a recommendation in terms of uh, coverages? Yeah, that's that's really going to vary from from uh, customer to customer. And the best thing Mm -hmm. they can do there is talk with their insurance agent or broker. Um, They're going to know their exposure is the best. Yep. Yeah, you've been doing this for quite some time, and you are pretty much an expert in you know, helping small, mid-sized businesses. What do you love most about this industry and and what you do? So first and foremost, you know, helping people, right? Like that's mm. I think a, a lot of reason why people get into insurance is it's a good feeling when you can you know help somebody at the end of the day understand you know what they're facing and and provide some solutions to to help them you know focus on doing what they do, right? you know, a manufacturer wants to make widgets. That's, that's what they're, they're doing. So yeah. like just trying to help them be able to, to focus on on yeah. what they're doing there. And then, you know, I think, as I mentioned earlier, 
it evolves so quickly and you know mm. it's it's ever it's an ever changing landscape uh in terms of kind of the exposures and how people react to them and so i think that's uh, part of the fascination of it at least from my standpoint is it, it never gets old there's always something new to to be looking at and learning about well before i ask you the final question any other thoughts that you'd like to share again i mean i think you know from a small business perspective, it's it's always going to be a challenge. You, you know, you've you've always got uh, many competing priorities and many competing areas for dollars. But I think you just you know you need to be aware of the exposures that are out there for you. I you know, and always looking forward, right? Like again, some yep. of these exposures weren't in existence ten years ago. They are now. Who knows what'll be here in in ten years? You know, we talked a little bit about generative AI increasing potential copyright infringement or you know, the mm. deep fakes making the social engineering more effective. The other thing is we mentioned breaches of personal information or wrongful dissemination of information as being kind of the one of the you know genesis of this coverage. Yeah. But privacy rights violation, more that wrongful collection of information. And you know, you may hear terms like pixel tracking. So again, just knowing mm. what your business is in and where you're at, just thinking through some of these future exposures is always always uh, a good place to be. Excellent insights. So, Eric, for our audience, what if they had one thing they could do today to improve their fortunes or to make their world a safer place? What would you recommend? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I'd harken back to the list we just talked about, right? Those four to five items that I just just yep. went through. I think you know, review that list. Think about those controls. I, I did try to kind of go through them in the order of increasing effort, complexity, cost. So, you know, if you start at the top and work your way down, I think that'd be a great place to at least start your your thinking. You know, again, recognizing that managing cyber risk is going to be an ongoing endeavor. And, and, yeah. and quite simply, you just need to start, right? You can't, mm. you, you're not going to be able to spend your way out of the risk by purchasing every technical solution, nor can you offload the totality of your risk through insurance. So you just, you just got to start. And, and don't get overwhelmed. It's great advice, Eric. Hey, it's been a lot of fun, very educational, and uh, thank you ever so much. You've helped a lot of people with your uh, your insights. You know, again, appreciate the opportunity, Jeff. Uh, had a blast doing it, and uh, you know, look forward to uh, helping anybody that we can. That's our podcast for today. I'm Jeff Edwards for the Safe House Initiative. Thanks for joining us. And remember, be safe, be resilient, and be kind to each other. For more information about the Safe House Initiative, please use your mobile device to scan the QR code on the screen or send us an email at info at safehouseinitiative.org or visit us on our website, safehouseinitiative.org. We look forward to hearing from you.